homesteaders, gardeners, and cooks. My name is Jennifer. Welcome to Miles Away Farm or welcome back if you're not new to the channel. I am making a pressure canned French onion soup today and the inspiration for this is these are onions that I grew last year and as you can see everything in this bowl is starting to sprout some more than others. I have a mix of red and yellow onions here. This one just has a tiny little sprout at the top, but these are not gonna hold in my pantry very much longer. And I made this recipe last year and really enjoyed it. And we just ate the last of it. It's great just as a French onion soup. And it's also really good to just throw into other things that you're making because it's essentially caramelized onions in a broth. And that's a very nice addition to all kinds of soups and stews. And so I, last time I did this, I did some of it in pint jars and some of it just in eight ounce jars so that I could just add it to other recipes. And that worked out really well. It's a nice way to use up about four pounds of onions and have them be shelf stable. And what I ended up doing with the last bit of this that we had was I had made a leg of lamb, kind of an osobuco for basically the Easter holiday. And it made a lot of kind of a stewy broth that was left over after we finished the meat. And so I ended up adding the French onion soup to that. And then we just ate it as French onion soup with toasted bread and Gruyere cheese over the top. And it was just absolutely delicious. And so, yeah, it's it definitely inspired me to make this recipe again because it has lots and lots of good purposes. The recipe book that I'm using for this is, if you guys have followed me for any amount of time, you know I love this. This is the all new ball book of canning and preserving. And it just has a lot of really, really great meals in a jar, a lot of good pressure canning recipes, a lot of recipes that are not just the same stuff that's in the basic ball blue book. And so this is the French onion soup recipe on page 290. And very simple, a little bit of olive oil, onions that are caramelized, salt and pepper, thyme, a little bit of white wine, and some beef broth. I'm gonna tweak the seasonings on it just a little bit. America's Test Kitchen has a French onion soup recipe that I really enjoy. And so I will probably take a look at that. With something like this that's pressure canned, this gets pressure canned. Pints are for 60 minutes, quarts are for an hour and 15 minutes. So it's gonna get pressure canned for a long time. Adding a little bit of change in terms of the herbs that are in there, in terms of the spice mix is not gonna affect the timing on how long we need to can this for. So pressure canned French onion soup. Let's get started. So this recipe calls for four pounds of onions. This is a little over four pounds. Because these are sprouting, I know there's gonna be quite a bit of onion that's gonna get cut off. And so I'm just gonna assume that there's gonna be quite a bit of waste here. You can see here how this is sprouting. And this is also a bit of a split and anytime you have a split um, onion where there's basically two lobes, you're always gonna have a little bit more rot in long-term storage. So this, this is gonna be a little bit messy, but that's why I'm making this recipe. The beauty of onions is because they are so segmented, you can have parts of them that have gone bad and other parts that are still salvageable, which is Really nice. And this sprouted part of this onion, while technically edible, I find it to be not super tasty. And so I'm just gonna discard the parts that are sprouting. Now there's nothing salvageable there. These are gonna be a little tricky to slice up because of how I'm having to take them apart. But we'll get there. And you can slice these in rounds or slivers. Basically think about what you wanna find on a spoon later when it's finished soup. Although everything is gonna be very, very soft, so it won't really matter that much. I follow Ethan Jabowski on YouTube and he loves doing like deep dive research onto things and it looks like he's doing an episode on 
the fastest way to caramelize onions because really good caramelized onions can take up to an hour and that's wildly time consuming and so he's clearly doing some experiments in order to figure out if there's a, an adequate way to do it quicker or not. Personally, as a science person myself, I love that kind of stuff. All right, so there's one onion. And we're just gonna keep going and I'll bring you back when these are all cut up. So here are our four pounds of onions and I did have to go grab a couple more because this is our pile of waste. So we had quite a bit of discard. So I needed to add a few more to get to four pounds here. All right, the original canning recipe calls for a quarter cup of olive oil. I'm gonna substitute some of that with clarified butter because I think it's a better flavor. The America's Test Kitchen recipe uses butter instead of olive oil. I don't have quite enough here. For, this is an eighth of a cup, so I'm gonna do some clarified butter and then the rest olive oil. And the reason this is such a high amount of oil, usually don't see this amount of oil in a canning recipe, is simply because these onions are gonna take a very long time to caramelize. And so we wanna make sure that we're not burning while we're caramelizing. Add. It's going to be hard to get all these in here, but hopefully they will all fit. It's always amazing how much onions will cook down. Like most vegetables, they have a lot of water in them. Most vegetables are at least 70 to 80 percent water. To this, I'm going to add a tablespoon of salt, not an insignificant amount. And this salt is going to help those onions sweat and release their moisture. I'm also adding a teaspoon of recently ground black pepper. So this says medium low heat and cover and cook for an hour which is interesting. What I'm going to do is cover this, let these sweat, set a timer for 15 minutes, and come back and give everything a good stir. So after an hour of cooking with the lid on, and honestly, probably at least another hour with the lid off, trying to evaporate all of that liquid. This is where we're at. And so at this point, I'm stirring it every three or four minutes while I'm doing other things in the kitchen and making sure that it doesn't stick. And we're starting to get to where we're almost done. And then we're gonna add our wine and cook that most of that alcohol out. But if I let this sit too long, it starts to stick on the bottom of the pot because at this point it's syrupy and sticky and most of that liquid has been evaporated. And so we're almost there. All right, at this point, I am gonna turn the heat up and just stir constantly until I really have a sticky mess. And then I'm gonna add in three cups of dry white wine. I'm using an inexpensive Chardonnay, just because that's happened to be what I have on hand. You can use whatever you like. You see that right there? There's a little bit that's stuck earlier. And that isn't burnt, it's just flavor, but we don't want the bottom to burn. probably been another 10 minutes or so and I think I'm gonna call these caramelized also I just don't have the patience to stir this anymore and you can see 
If there's no liquid left in the pan, and it's definitely, like if I don't keep stirring this, it's gonna start sticking. So we're gonna add in our wine. And the recipe says three cups of dry white wine divided, and then I can't find any place that it actually doesn't call for all of it. I don't know what that's about. So I'm just gonna assume it's a typo and I'm gonna add it all. This is basically the equivalent of a bottle of wine. You could just use a bottle. We're gonna keep our heat up high and cook this to where most of it is evaporated off. And interestingly, the recipe that I have from America's Test Kitchen also calls for white wine in onion soup. I think it's pretty classic in a French onion soup to include some wine. It gives it a very distinct and very delicious flavor. Almost forgot to this, I'm gonna add a teaspoon of dried thyme. And this recipe doesn't call for it, but the America's Test Kitchen recipe calls for parsley, a bay leaf, and some balsamic, and so I'm gonna add that as well. Not expecting this dried parsley to add a lot of flavor, but why not? And I'm adding these now just basically to let them fully rehydrate for that bay leaf to have some time to impart its flavor before I take it out later. Okay, so it's been 10 minutes. We're not where we were, but most of that wine has cooked off, which is what we wanted. Now we're gonna add three quarts of beef broth. So 12 cups. And I'm using a combination of some home canned beef broth that I have, but I don't have three quarts of this. And so I'm just gonna use one quart of this. And then I'm gonna use two quarts of better than bouillon beef broth. And I always keep better than bouillon chicken stock and beef stock in my fridge because sometimes it's not that critical that the flavor be perfect. And sometimes I just don't wanna open a jar of home canned stock when I only need a half a cup or a cup of something. Right. This is pretty liquidy. We're gonna cook this for 15 minutes so it is gonna evaporate down a little bit, but it's a soup. It's not supposed to be super thick. And the density of this or the liquidiness of this is actually important to the recipe. Pressure canning recipes are based partially on density and the thicker and more dense food is, the longer the time is for the heat to penetrate to the center of the jar. And so we want to follow the recipe pretty closely to what is actually written. They build a lot of leeway into them because everybody does things slightly differently and they know that. So there's a pretty big safety margin, but you don't want to drastically change the density of something without knowing how to change the time. So this is looking pretty good. And I am gonna add to this, well, first I should taste it. Let me taste it. It's good. It's very rich. I am gonna add a tablespoon of balsamic, which is called for in the Cook's Illustrated recipe, although the ratios are different, just because it feels like we need just a little bit of acidity against how rich that is. And that balsamic is also gonna add some umami. I'm a big balsamic fan. And this is not an expensive balsamic. This is an off the shelf, you know, Trader Joe's type of balsamic. But I think that little bit of acidity in there Yeah, that made a huge difference. So salt, fat, acid, heat, anytime you have a dish and you're like, mm, feels a little flat, not what I was hoping for, think to yourself, is it salty enough? Does it need a little spice? Does it need a little bit of acid? And that can be vinegars, that can be citrus. There can be different ways of achieving that. It could be wine, or does it need a little bit of richness? And most of the time I find when a recipe is kind of falling flat, it needs a little bit of acid. All right, we're gonna let that come to a simmer and simmer for 15 minutes. 
right, I just turned this off and I've switched sides because I have more counter space on this side in order to fill my jars. I need to get rid of this bay leaf that's in there. And ready, we are ready to jar up our soup. This recipe claims to make eight pints. I have a sneaking suspicion we're going to end up with more than that. And I need one inch of headspace. I'm going to try to dip kind of straight down and up so that I get a good mix of broth and onions. I find this particular recipe book is a little more accurate than some of the other ball books in terms of yield. I write all over my recipes when I make them and put a date so that I know if something makes more than it says it does so that I can be ready for that next time. And because of that quarter cup of oil that we started this recipe with, I'm going to really make sure I wipe my rims well because if there's oil on the rim of the jar, it's going to prevent it from sealing well. And so I'm going to wipe everything off with white vinegar. And what I'm going to do here is just even these out and use a little bit of water to make them all the same. All right, I thought I was going to need to add a little bit of water, but I have this little cool tool to measure headspace. And these are all about an inch. I did even things out just a little bit. But we are right where we want to be, where the bottom of that is just touching the liquid. So no additional liquid necessary. Wow, I don't know if I've ever had a recipe come out that evenly before, that's awesome. So in order to wipe our rims, I'm just gonna do a little bit of white vinegar sure there's no residue on there and even with the paper towel I can feel just a little bit of residue on there so I just want to make sure everything's very very clean I'm gonna go back through the second time it's very frustrating to get this far into a recipe you know, something that's, I started this at like 4.30 in the afternoon. It's now 8.30 at night. Granted, I've done a lot of other things as well, but it's very frustrating to spend that much time on a recipe and then have the jar not seal. So I'm gonna really try to make sure I get a good seal here. I'm mostly using four jars lids, although I do have some other random lids as well. They are all either ball or cur. Don't use inexpensive random house brands of lids. It's not worth the risk. A lot of times the really inexpensive ones just don't work, especially with pressure canning. Cheap lids can buckle and that's a bummer. All right, so finger tight, which means just tight enough to where you start feeling it grip. I've said this in many videos, but the idea here is that airspace is gonna heat up and expand inside the jar and push out. And then as the jar cools, it's gonna pull that lid down and create a vacuum. And if your jar is too tight, that air cannot escape as it heats and it will cause your lid to buckle. Sometimes it will also cause the liquid itself to siphon out around the edges. And especially with something with oil in it like this, that will mess up your seal. So trying to do the best we can here. It's not a foolproof science. I still occasionally have pressure can jars, not seal. These ones that have writing on them, I was using them for things that were not actually canned. I was just storing things in mason jars and writing on it with a Sharpie. And so those have not actually, they've been on a jar, but they haven't been heated. All right, let's get these in the canner. So this is preheated. Every pressure canner is different in terms of how much water you need to put in it. So follow the directions for yours. Even if you bought it used, pretty much every pressure canner in the world has got a model number on it 
where you can look it up and download it. And so you can find information on canners even if they're used and old. But mine takes three quarts of water and then I add a couple of tablespoons of white vinegar and that is to keep minerals from sticking to the sides of the jar, especially because we have very minerally well water and so that's to prevent that. The water will not cover the jars. Pressure canning is different from water bath canning. All right, we're gonna put our lid on here. We're gonna turn the heat back on. The water was hot, the jars were hot, so everything was hot, so no thermal shock. We're gonna turn this on, bring it back to a boil, and then let it vent. Steam is gonna come out of this hole for 10 minutes before we put the weight on it and start bringing it up to pressure. Oh, I meant to show you guys the inside of this. All right, these have been processed for 60 minutes. Let the pressure release naturally. Took the lid off, let them sit for another five minutes. And now I'm gonna take them out and let them cool overnight. If you look at these closely, can you guys see how that's still bubbling? That's normal for pressure canning. Basically, the liquid inside those jars is still boiling even though we are at regular pressure. And if it's still boiling in the jar when you set it on the counter like that, that's a pretty good indication that your jar is going to seal, in my experience. And when I first took the lid off the canner, everything was still boiling. So I'm just gonna look what I'm seeing here. The lids are starting to pop. This one's really rocking and rolling. You can see this one is still going. That one's still going for sure. This one has movement. So hopefully, when I get up in the morning, everything will be sealed. All right, you guys, it's the next morning. And here are our onion soups. One of them did not seal, and I stashed it in the fridge. But these guys are shelf stable and ready for quick meals or great for adding to other soups and stews to make them taste even more incredible. Thanks for watching, Tribe. If you like this kind of content, give me a thumbs up, subscribe, leave me a comment, and share. I have new content coming out every week.